Five, four, three, two, one. The Ways and Means Committee will come to order. Uh, good morning and a word of welcome. We are holding today's hearing in a hybrid format in compliance with the rules and regulations for remote committee proceedings pursuant to House Resolution 8. Before we begin, I want to remind members of a few procedures to keep the proceedings running smoothly. First, consistent with regulations, the committee will keep microphones muted to limit background noise. Members are responsible for unmuting themselves when they seek recognition or when recognized for five minutes. Committee staff will mute members only in the event of an inadvertent background noise section. Second, when members are present in the proceeding via WebEx, they must have their cameras on. If you need to step away to attend another proceeding, please turn your camera and audio off rather than logging out of the platform. Finally, consistent with recent revised guidance made by the Office of the Attending Physician, members may briefly remove their masks when under recognition to speak, but should replace their, rat, their mask at the conclusion of their remarks. This new change in guidance is a reflection of what and why we are on our way back to normalcy. But we aren't quite there yet. And so we will continue to adhere to health guidelines, including maintaining six foot social distancing on the dais to best protect the health of staff, families, and our communities. Thank you for your continued cooperation as we continue to serve our country together in this time of need. Now I will turn to the topic of today's hearing the 2021 Biden administration trade policy agenda. Today, we have the privilege to welcome Ambassador Catherine Tai, United States Trade Representative, to the Ways and Means Committee hearing room. Ambassador Tai, I'm pleased to welcome you back to this committee for your new and very well-earned role. Your prior work in this committee uniquely positions you to understand better than most the importance of U.S. trade policy as it supports American working families and businesses. Over the past 14 months, the COVID pandemic has upended lives across this country and around the world. It has exposed the fragility of our economic and health system. It has also revealed that many of us have known for quite some time, and that is that our economic and health policies have not always benefited everyone equitably. As vaccination rates increase and the world begins to reopen, we are left with an economy in need of revitalization and people in need of help. We have an opportunity to set the American economy and American workers on a better course. As you know, the Democrats on the committee have been actively working to create these policies that are inclusive, equitable, and responsive to the changing dynamics of global economics. I am committed to putting forward more informed solutions to correct inequities and ensure that all Americans are benefiting from trade opportunities. Through a trade and equity lens, we must aggressively enforce our trade agreements, ensure that our trade policies help to create good-paying, quality jobs, rebuild alliances with our trading partners to tackle the challenge of global economic and public health recoveries, confront China's unfair trade practices, human rights abuses, and growing anti-democratic influences. We need to explore new trade opportunities with like-minded countries and work to ensure that our policies promote racial equity and correct inequities. Ambassador Tai, you know better than most that the House Democrats fought hard to establish a new structure for aggress aggressive enforcement of USMCA and to provide the necessary funding to bring strong enforcement actions. I'm very proud of these new standards that we were able to establish in USMCA particularly the closing of loopholes in the state-to-state -state enforcement mechanism and creation of novel rapid response mechanisms, which I can see already appear to have occurred as part of the challenge that we offered. I was pleased with your announcement yesterday that you will use these tools to pursue alleged labor violations at a General Motors plant in Mexico. I know and hope you'll be able to perhaps briefly comment on that immediate outcome. I was very pleased with the filing of the petition by our friends in labor under the rapid response mechanism. Trade agreements only succeed if they are enforced, and I look forward to working with you to ensure aggressive enforcement of USMCA 
that supports workers at home and abroad. We not only need to ensure that our trading partners are playing by the rules, but that we have a responsibility to make sure that our own policies and actions are consistent with trade agreement obligations. This means that as we create new policies that are responsive to the needs of today, we must respect our international trade commitments. I'm convinced that we can pursue a bold, forward-looking policy that is in consistency with our international obligations. Done right, trade can be a powerful driver for good-paying, quality jobs in a thriving economy. We must ensure, however, that our trade policies promote human rights, high labor standards, and environmental protections. I am certainly troubled by the actions coming from China. China's use of forced labor in Xinjiang, blatant steps to suppress democratic institutions and practices in Hong Kong, alarming threats of the invasion potentially of Taiwan, and pervasive unfair trading practices that will require our immediate attention. We must be unwavering in our condemnation of these actions and use every tool available to confront destructive practices. But we should not go it alone. We should work with our allies to address the challenges we face with China, as well as steps needed to address the global economic recovery. Rebuilding trust and strengthening our alliances with Europe, Asia, Africa, and our neighbors in the Americas will be a key to our success. In addition, we must take every available opportunity to urge our trading partners to join our efforts to eradicate forced labor, combat climate change, sustain institutions and practices that support open societies and fair markets. We must reassert ourselves on the world stage, including at the WTO. Multilateral institutions provide a powerful platform to address some of these global challenges. As the U.S. begins to lead again at the WTO, I urge you to seek longstanding reform of the dispute settlement system, transparency and notification obligations, special differential treatments, and subsidy disciplines. I also implore you to raise issues that have often been overlooked by the institution, namely labor, climate change, and women's economic empowerment. It is important that the WTO not only correct past mistakes, but look ahead to serve as a platform to address the needs during these times. As we work to repair our alliances both bilaterally and multilaterally, we cannot miss the opportunity to explore new trade arrangements with like-minded countries. I am especially supportive of deepening our ties with Europe and Africa and look forward to partnering with the administration in developing an approach that benefits both our interests and indeed those of our trading partners. Today's hearing allows members of this committee to hear from you directly about the administration's vision for U.S. trade policy. And equally important, this is an opportunity for you to hear from us about priorities. This conversation is a building block for requisite partnerships between Congress and the administration to create policies that benefit all Americans. Trade policy fulfills its greatest potential when it is the product of close collaboration between Congress, Democrats and Republicans, and the executive. I am immensely, I am immensely pleased to have someone in the top trade post who understands firsthand that Congress' involvement in USMCA made a better labor agreement. And I hope to have the same level of partnership as the administration forges ahead with its agenda. Look forward to hearing from you on how we can work together to craft the trade policy that corrects the inequities of yesterday, meets the challenges of today, and anticipates the needs of tomorrow. With that, let me recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady, for his opening statement. Thank you, Chairman Neal. Welcome back to the committee, Ambassador Tai. As I've said before, I have every confidence that you'll be successful in this new role, not only because you're trade policy expertise, but because you're such a skilled and strong negotiator. You understand what it takes to get trade policy done on the Hill, the need for bipartisanship, intensive consultation, and transparency. And after our success on USMCA, I know that we can work together. Republicans are eager to work with you, the Biden administration, and Democrats to benefit American workers and families through our trade policies. Now, I admit, President Biden inherited a strong economy in life-saving vaccines, and I worry that he will sab sabotage our jobs recovery with crippling tax increases that hurt working families and drive American jobs overseas. I always also worry that with the federal unemployment bonus, four out of 10 Americans getting paid more to stay home than to reconnect with work, which is really making Main Street businesses struggle. 
but that's all about jobs. And we have that need for jobs. This is a bipartisan issue, and it brings me to my first point. The Biden administration's trade agreement moratorium needs to cease. It's not enough to buy American. We need to sell American all throughout the world. We need new customers for our blue-collar manufacturing workers, for our farmers, for our Main Street businesses. It is, we need new trade agreements to promote our workers and sell our products, whether in the UK, Kenya, Japan, the EU, the Asia Pacific, or elsewhere. It is the right time. We have the right US trade representative in place, and we have the right bipartisan dynamics to move these agreements forward. The first step is to renew the strong partnership between Congress and the Administration on Trade to Trade Promotion Authority. We must get started quickly so we can negotiate these agreements and sell American, as well as send a strong signal to the rest of the world that America will lead on trade. And we have to enforce these agreements, too. I'm disturbed, as you are, by Mexico's lack of compliance on energy and agriculture in particular. Vigorous enforcement of USMCA in its entirety is essential to maintaining the agreement's strong bipartisan support. We should also renew GSP and MTB. These programs should not have been allowed to lapse. It's hurting our job creators and workers, and we must work together to move forward sooner rather than later. When it comes to trade with China, there is more work to be done together. After tough negotiations, the previous administration forced China to end barriers to U.S. agriculture and greatly improve intellectual property standards and enforcement. I hope this administration will not only enforce the agreement we reached, but will also work with our allies to build off its success and launch the next phase. Phase one was no easy lift. The U.S. bore the brunt by leading the negotiations. Our allies should step up with us. We are stronger together. We also must stand by our allies. India and many other nations are in crisis and need access to COVID-19 vaccines. Republicans and Democrats alike agree we must act urgently and practically to get those vaccines to them. But surrendering American technology, as this administration is actively pursuing, will not solve the practical problems that are preventing vaccines from being broadly available. Simply handling, handing over the U.S. technology doesn't provide a single shot to people who need it now. Just consider, a country has to build or adapt manufacturing, produce this pioneering technology, and develop a workforce with specialized expertise, it has to require raw materials from all over the world, and some are in short supply. Then it has to figure out distribution. All that can take years. So instead of making vaccines broadly available around the world, I believe the administration's move endangers American pat patients and future medical development by punishing the companies that spent billions to innovate these life-saving vaccines. And it rewards China, giving it the risk of access to U.S. innovation, something Chinese spies, as recently as last June, were arrested for attempting to steal. Instead. Let's look together to develop solutions that will solve the very real logistical hurdles, slowing access in our developing countries as neighbors. Finally, Republicans and Democrats share a commitment to the success in the reform of the WTO. Republicans are eager to resume WTO environmental goods agreement negotiations, to eliminate tariffs on U.S. clean energy exports while creating American jobs and benefiting the environment. And I'll conclude like I began. With USMCA, together we helped working families, blue-collar workers, and job creators by advancing our trade policies in a smart, bipartisan way. Let's continue to do so. I look forward to working with you, Ambassador, and with Chairman Neal on the opportunities before that. With that, thank you, Chairman. Thank you, Mr. Brady. And without objection, all members' opening statements will be made part of the official record. Now, a uh, great pleasure and honor to turn to our esteemed witness, the United States Trade Ambassador, Catherine Tai. Your statement will be part of the record in its entirety, and I would ask you to summarize your testimony in five minutes or less. You've heard that in this room before. And to help you with the time, please keep an eye on the clock. I will notify you when time has expired. I also want to use the opportunity, and, and I'm going to yield to Mr. Brady, to recognize another esteemed member of the Ways and Means family who is about to proceed to a new assignment and to acknowledge that Angela Ellard 
is about to become one of the parts of the New World Trade Organization WTO Deputy Directors General. Throughout her nearly three decades on this Ways and Means Committee, she has skillfully negotiated trade deals and crafted our nation's trade policy, and I might say in a very pleasant way. All the while gaining a sophisticated understanding of the opportunities available and the challenges facing WTO. She has been dogged in her defense of the House institutional prerogatives, and her commitment to public service is unmatched. I wish her the very best in this new endeavor, and now let me recognize Mr. Brady. Chairman, thank you. In the trade world, there is no one quite like Angela Ellard. She's brilliant, hardworking, and devoted to getting trade right. She's been a devoted public servant for nearly three decades on the Ways and Means Committee, advancing the prosperity of America's workers and businesses. Through her work on 13 trade agreements, she's opened the doors for Americans to deliver goods and services worldwide, strengthening our economy and securing our leadership abroad. Uh, she is a friend and has been just a tremendous leader. And while I and the Ways and Means Committee will miss her knowledge and insight, uh, I'm convinced her experience and commitment to excellence will be a major asset for the World Trade Organization. And, and I commend Ambassador Tai. Uh, for uh, directing that nomination. And I want to join you, Chairman, in the committee in congratulating Angela and, get, and extending our best wishes in her new role as Deputy Director General. Thank you, Mr. Brady. <laughs> Ambassador Tai, would you please proceed? Thank you, Chairman Neal, Ranking Member Brady members of the committee for inviting me to testify on the President's trade agenda. It is great to be back with you. It is so good to be back in Longworth. Our worker-centric trade policy is a key part of the Biden-Harris administration's effort to build back better. We are making real strides towards ending the pandemic. There are pockets of progress and hope, but we still have a lot of work ahead. I want to thank Congress for passing the American Rescue Plan which has helped to get shots in arms and money in the pockets of millions of Americans. The American Jobs Plan and the American Families Plan would combine to make bold investments that build a better foundation for decades of economic growth. These extraordinary times demand extraordinary leadership to defeat COVID-19. We will not let intellectual property rights get in the way of saving lives, but our announcement is just one part of the administration's global effort. We will pursue text-based negotiations at the WTO, and I am encouraged that other countries have already announced that they will join us. We will also continue to ramp up our efforts working with the private sector to expand vaccine manufacturing and distribution around the world. This comprehensive effort will save lives and help heal the economy. We are re-engaging the world from a position of strength. We want a fair international trading system that promotes inclusive growth and reflects America's values. The worker-centered trade policy outlined in the President's trade agenda will foster broad-based equitable growth, increase innovation, and give workers a seat at the table. Last week, I announced our transparency principles and the appointment of our chief transparency officer. And for the first time, the President's trade agenda included the goal of racial equity. Our thoughtful, sustained engagement will help us better understand how our proposed policies affect all communities, and we will consider those effects before making policy decisions. Trade policy must also help protect the environment and fight climate change. We can incentivize a race to the top and build a cleaner and brighter future with high-paying jobs. Our farmers, ranchers, fishers, and food processors will also benefit from our new approach. We are turning the page on erratic trade policies and looking to expand global market opportunities while enforcing global trade standards. Our trading partners must live up to their commitments. Sustained American leadership and re-engagement with our allies, trading partners, and economic competitors will be key. We will work with the World Trade Organization's new Director General, Dr. Ngozi Okonjo-Iweala, and like-minded countries to reform the WTO's rules and procedures so it can be a relevant force for good in the 21st century. 
We are also working to resolve the ongoing Boeing Airbus dispute and address the real problem of overcapacity in the steel and aluminum sectors. Solutions to both are within reach. We will not hesitate to call out China's coercive and unfair trade practices that harm American workers, undermine the multilateral system, or violate basic human rights. And we are developing a strategic approach to our trade and economic relationship. We welcome fair competition, but if China cannot or will not adapt to international rules and norms, we must level the playing field. Closer to home, we are using every tool available to make sure our existing agreements work for real people. The United States-Mexico-Canada agreement gives me confidence that this approach is worthwhile. USMCA is a starting point for future efforts in the region that explicitly acknowledge climate change, aggressively address global forced labor issues, and expand the benefits of trade to underserved communities. I will enforce the new standards, follow through on our commitments, and use the agreement to ensure that Canada and Mexico do too. This week, you've seen that we are committed to using these tools. The innovative rapid response mechanism will allow us to address longstanding labor issues in Mexico. I was proud to announce the inaugural use of this tool yesterday, and I commend the government of Mexico for stepping in when it heard about the voting irregularities earlier. I am proud to partner with Mexico to prevent a race to the bottom. As you can see, we have our work cut out for us, but I'm confident that we can walk, chew gum, and play chess at the same time. I'm proud to carry the strength and creativity of our small but mighty agency into this room today. Thank you for your time, and I look forward to your questions. Thank you, Ambassador Tai. Without objection, each member will be recognized for five minutes to question our witness. In this hybrid setting, we will dispense with the Gibbons rule and will go in the order of seniority, switching between majority and minority members, and I will begin by recognizing myself. Ambassador, as we work to build back better, it's important that we embrace our allies and not shrink from our alliances. We must continue to be a champion for American innovation, labor rights, and environmental protections. The European Union is one of our closest allies with whom we share a common history and democratic values. My belief is that it should be a priority as we go forward with trade negotiations. How do you intend to work with the European Union to resolve trade issues and explore opportunities for deepening our economic and trade cooperation, both bilaterally and through multilateral opportunities at WTO? Chairman Neal, I know how you feel uh, about the potential for uh, U.S.-EU cooperation, in particular um, uh, economic cooperation, and I agree that there is a lot of potential um, that we have yet to realize, and we have an enormous opportunity right now um, to, to work on this relationship and in, in some ways to build back better the U.S.-EU relationship. I want to assure you that a lot of our work right now, uh, right out of the gate, is focused on um, uh, promoting cooperation with the European Union. First of all, we are uh, working very, very hard under a four-month um, time period where we have suspended our re retaliatory tariffs on each other for the Boeing Airbus disputes uh, to focus our teams on truly committing to resolving these 16-year-old disputes that have been um, litigated through the WTO for almost two decades now. Uh, we are also uh, working with our European counterparts on a number of different um, uh, initiatives uh, to strengthen our cooperation, including in the areas of um, uh, uh, addressing global uh, trade distortions, um, like the overcapacity in the steel and aluminum sectors, and looking really um, at forward-looking uh, initiatives where we can partner effectively um, to harness all of our shared values economically and politically uh, to address the significant challenges that we face uh, coming from other corners of the world. And uh, Ambassador, when China joined the WTO in 2001, the expectation was that WTO membership would lead China to become more democratic, embrace a greater respect for human rights, and develop a market-based economy. China clearly has not met that expectation. Do you think the global trading system itself needs to develop new tools to address the challenges posed by China, and how would you envision working with our allies to help confront some of these acute challenges in China, namely forced labor and human rights abuses? Well, 
Chairman Neal, I um, agree with you that uh, when China joined the WTO, there was a lot of hope and expectation uh, that membership uh, in the WTO uh, would really lead to uh, China internalizing a lot of the norms um, economically and politically that are represented by the members of the WTO. Uh, over time, we have seen that um, um, we all make choices, countries make choices, governments make choices, and along the way, we see that um, uh, the choices that China has made has not led it to the results that many of those supportive of its um, accession to the WTO had hoped for. Um, so uh, let me take your question in a couple parts. One is it is critical to work with um, uh, others um, to um, uh, confront, um, to work on, uh, to communicate with China in all the ways where its policies are really powerfully impactful on the rest of the world uh, that are not impactful in a positive way. Um, at the WTO, yes, uh, we need new rules, um, but I, I also want to emphasize that uh, some of the foundational rules at the WTO need to be reshored and reformed uh, in order for the WTO to become relevant to address the challenges that we have given the changes in the global economy and the changes in the relationships between WTO members that have happened in the past 25 years. Thank you, Ambassador. Now let me recognize the ranking member, Mr. Brady. Thank you, Chairman. So, Ambassador, I know you know the un, uh, understand the significance of trade promotion authority for our negotiating our trade agenda and how it really defines the shared constitutional authority of Congress and the President on trade. Every president deserves to have a TPA. Uh, they're not necessarily easy to negotiate, but they pull the framework together. Uh, of any new administration or existing administration. Uh, our trading partners need to know we're serious about opening new markets, and TPA sends that strong signal. I know I'm eager to begin working on TPA legislation with Chairman Neal, uh, with the Senate as well. Can you give us a time frame as to when the administration will be ready to sit down with us to begin modernizing or updating TPA? Congressman Brady, I know um, your interest in this particular issue and this particular mechanism um, uh, that has been used so often in um, defining the partnership between uh, Congress, this committee, um, and uh, USTR and the administration uh, in the negotiations of uh, new trade agreements. Um, and uh, you and I have talked about um, uh, uh, how important this is to you. Um, I appreciate you raising it here today. Um, what I would like to reinforce is that, uh, from my perspective, um, in order to uh, do this right, um, uh, I am interested in having a TPA uh, that uh, is uh, robustly supported um, in a bipartisan, bicameral way here in Congress. And um, just like I've said about our trade agreements, um, I very much hope that USMCA and the kind of support that we saw for it uh, will be a, a model for proceeding from here on out. That is the kind of support that we need to have in the United States. And I would very much like to um, um, uh, convey to you that those sentiments apply equally uh, to TPA. So can I ask follow up? So in your mind, and I'm not pinning you down, but on general timetable thinking, is this a next month discussion we can begin having? Is this a this year discussion? Is it a never discussion, you know, what in your view is a timetable that we can be thinking about? Again, I, I'm not tying you down the day, I'm just trying to get a sense. I understand, Mr. Brady. Um, traditionally, uh, TPA has uh, been an articulation of uh, the objectives that the United States government, the Congress, and the administration will pursue through a trade negotiating uh, agenda. Um, in my mind, um, what we have an opportunity to do right now is to rethink um, the way TPA works and also really to, to, to rethink the objectives that we want to be pursuing through our trade agreements. Um, to be a little bit more specific, I think that right now, on the heels of USMCA and still struggling to get through a pandemic, um, 
from my perspective here in the administration, uh, I think that um, uh, there is an opportunity um, to look at TPA through the lens of Build Back Better. And that would be, uh, I think, a very important objective to uh, clarify from the administration side. And I would invite, in the meantime, uh, members of Congress to think about uh, this opportunity at this time in history in terms of uh, what a trade uh, agreement negotiating agenda should accomplish for the U.S. economy, but also for uh, a global recovery. So if I say this year, is there any chance you could just give us a big wink? Uh, well, let me say this. Um, let's do the work. Let's, <laughs> let's do the thinking. Sounds good. Ambassador, I know you're well aware of my strong disagreement with the administration's support for the waiver uh, on busting of patents on the WCO. We need to get these vaccines out. It, it is a real responsibility. But I think the best way to solve this is to rapidly increase the manufacturing and distribution of COVID vaccines to all our global neighbors. I think the, this waiver undermines those efforts and certainly in the long term. So can I ask you just some questions that, that, that I'm thinking about? So what terms will the United States seek in this waiver? For example, the duration and the details on how it's implemented. Will the waiver be tied to manufacturing and distribution? You know, will the United States walk away from negotiations if other participants don't agree to limiting the scope to vaccines only? And then a practical question of who, who will conduct these sensitive negotiations for the U.S. Uh, we know there are no deputies in place. Our new WTO ambassador hasn't been nominated. How do you see that going forward? So, Congressman Brady, um, I've got uh, three seconds, and I'm going to try to put as much in here. Um, I wanted to engage uh, very seriously, and I really appreciate um, the, the constructive way you've asked your question uh, about um, um, focusing on manufacturing and distribution. Uh, I think that those are important components, but uh, at the WTO, what we are hearing from the waiver proponents is that uh, they feel extremely vulnerable uh, and in not having access to vaccines and not being able to make them either. And this reminds me of um, uh, the really important uh, principle that um, you know um, you can you can give a man a fish um, and feed him for a day, but you can teach him to fish, and he can he can he can he can. He can have a meal for a lifetime, right? And I, I think that you know one important question is looking at where there is manufacturing capacity in the world, and then seeing that there are some segments of the world that are completely, very, very much uh, limited in being able to manufacture vaccines for themselves. So that's one thing I wanted to to, to say. On your other questions, um, let me condense my answer to just say this: um, the announcement last week um, to support the waiver. Uh, it means a lot of things, but as a practical matter, it means that this administration has committed itself to roll up our sleeves and engage, engage at the WTO, to exercise leadership there, to hear the concerns on both sides of this issue, and to drive towards a solution that will help to save lives. Because without a solution here, we are going to be in an economic recovery limbo for a very long time. And all of these other things we're talking about are not really going to translate into um, much if the rest of the world can't recover just along with us at the same pace. Thank you, Ambassador. Chairman, thanks. Thank you, Mr. Brady. Let me recognize the gentleman from Texas, Mr. Doggett, to inquire. Uh, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Uh, Ambassador, our country uh, is so fortunate to have a leader like you, your integrity, uh, your insight, and your priorities. Uh, I uh, was, of course, particularly pleased by the action that you took with reference to the need to get more vaccine manufactured around the world uh, to meet the pandemic needs that uh, we see so painfully demonstrated in other corners of the world, much as happened here last year. Uh, as you look at that uh, whole question of where we go from here on the TRIPS waiver, I think it's not surprising that those uh, here in the Congress who have opposed at every step attempts to protect American consumers from prescription price gouging would not look favorably on action to protect Americans from uh, COVID variants developing around the globe by addressing global health and having more va vaccine manufactured. Uh, we've heard uh, 
one manufacturer suggests that they might raise the price of their vaccine almost tenfold from 1950 to $175 a dose. Uh, we know that the, va- the, the principal vaccines have relied on research and technology developed at public expense at NIH. And in the case of the Moderna vaccine, almost 100% financed by the taxpayers who have a stake uh, in what's happening with these vaccines. Uh, You have mentioned uh, in your comments that time is of the essence. And I think it certainly is uh, both the scope uh, and the urgency of uh, addressing this uh, matter. Uh, And I would just ask you to comment further on what we can expect to see Uh, to address the very urgent need, as you said, time is of the essence. Mr. Doggett, I know how important these issues are to you. Um, And um, uh, thank you for your kind words. Um, Your questions are serious ones. And um, uh, let me say this. Um, uh, Let me take it in two parts. One is, uh, what can we expect to see uh, in the trade lane uh, at the WTO? And um, as I mentioned earlier in my response to Congressman Brady, um, you can expect from us a full commitment uh, to the WTO uh, to rise to the challenge of this moment to um, produce an outcome uh, that is going to impact people's lives directly and positively. This is not easy. The WTO um, uh, has not um, uh, got a record of um, moving quickly. Uh, or getting to yes across 164 uh, members who must all agree uh, very often. Uh, but if, uh, if we can't do this now, then um, I think that, um, let me put it this way in a, in a more positive light, this is the opportunity for the WTO to show its relevance for mankind. Um, let me just pause there and see if that's been responsive to your question. Well, thank you. And I know that uh, there are already companies in Israel and Canada and Denmark that have expressed an interest in manufacturing generic copies. uh, And uh, we just look forward to working with you to see that we actually make a difference with this waiver in uh, coming months, not in coming years. Let me touch on another area that has been important to you. Uh, I remember a time in this committee when uh, Uh, Long ago, the chairman actually ridiculed the notion of environmental and labor standards being part of our trade agenda. You have made it uh, central to what is now a 21st century trade policy. Uh, One issue that I've been concerned with for several years is the general system of preferences. I introduced uh, legislation called the Earth Act, which has now been incorporated along with other important provisions in legislation Mr. Blumenauer has offered. Uh, Can we expect to see environmental criteria included within GSP uh, in the near future? Congressman Doggett, um, uh, what I would say is this. uh, GSP is um, um, a statutory program, uh, and um, uh, Congress has a lot to say about this. uh, But from my perspective, um, yes, uh, I am. The administration is fully supportive of taking this opportunity uh, for reauthorizing GSP in the year 2021. Uh, to update it, to match all of the progress that we have made in other areas of our trade policy, and that includes um, incorporating uh, environmental criterion. Thank you. And finally, uh, I'm very appreciative of the action that you have taken uh, to give meaning to the labor standards within the USMCA. Uh, Do you anticipate being able to take the same kind of priority on the environmental standards in our trade agreements. As you know, I've been particularly concerned about the failures of Peru with regard to timber uh, being harvested from brain forest. Um, Yes, Mr. Doggett, uh, the environmental standards that we have in our agreements uh, need to be enforced. Uh, That is a priority. And I just want to say even more broadly, enforcement of our trade agreements is a commitment uh, that we are making to our trading partners that uh, these agreements that have all come through Congress uh, must mean something. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Let Chairman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Nunez, to Thank inquire. You. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador Tai, welcome back to the committee. Uh, really uh, honored to have you here, and uh, former Ways and Means staff uh, in your position is, is really great to see. So congratulations on your appointment. Uh, I want to turn uh, to this agreement on, on trips that many people have, have talked about. 
uh, the trade-related aspects of intellectual property rights. It would force the American developers of COVID-19 vaccines and therapeutics to relinquish their intellectual property rights to these medicines and essentially show foreign nations how to produce these drugs themselves. Now, I understand your point about we really want these vaccines to get out, but at the same time, this is American technology that spent billions of dollars uh, developing. And one of the concerns I have is really the only country that could quickly make these types of vaccines that could implement this would be China. Uh, I know that India and others are, are saying that, but it really seems like they want to steal this very new technology, especially as it relates to the Moderna and Pfizer vaccines. So uh, did you conduct any analysis on this front of what would, of what would happen, you know, who, who could actually make these vaccines? Um, thank you, um, Congressman Nunes. Uh, yes, um, this decision was made um, after a lot of deliberation. Um, and uh, uh, we in, I, th I think is an, un we have adopted uh, what I think is an unusual uh, practice, at least for USTR. Uh, starting in mid-April, I began consultations um, with uh, interested uh, parties, um, uh, labor organizations, um, civil society, public health advocates, um, public health experts, both inside and outside of the government, um, uh, and also the manufacturers themselves. Uh, we take policymaking extremely seriously, and so uh, my short answer to you uh, is uh, yes, uh, we are thinking through, we have really dug into the policy implications. And let me say this, in terms of our announcement of uh, support for um, waiving intellectual property rights at the WTO, support for the goals of the proponents at the WTO, um, uh, what we are committing to is starting a process at the WTO uh, to find a solution at the WTO that is going to have to, uh, through these negotiations, take into account uh, concerns from all sides uh, so that we can have something that is effective and practical in saving lives. So, so we're obviously we're very proud that uh, one, another one of our staff, longtime staff, Ms. Ellard, is going to be going to WTO. but. WTO, you know, hasn't really been a, a beacon of, of, of light and freedom. Uh, they've had tremendous issues, as, as you are well aware, and I know we're always trying to work and fix and make the WTO function better, but, I mean, you did mention the manufacturers, and that, to me, is the, is the key here. The manufacturers who develop this, who develop these vaccines, they're U.S. companies, and just to turn over that intellectual property to these other nations, I mean, especially China, who we still don't have a full understanding of the origins of this virus at this time and what their involvement was. Uh, do, do you know, I mean, when you met with the U.S. manufacturers, did they explain to you, uh, express to you their concern about China being able to, to utilize this and be the only one that could really make the vaccine? Well, uh, I want to be a little bit circumspect about exactly what the manufacturers told me and, and how they told me, but let me, let me offer you a couple um, uh, observations and insights from my conversations with the individual manufacturers and also with their uh, trade associations, um, which uh, is that um, the manufacturers, there are quite a number of them, they're not a monolithic group. They're actually, um, their technologies are different. Um, uh, their their uh, leadership personalities are different, and um, their corporate philosophies are uh, actually quite different as well. And some of these manufacturers do think of themselves not just as businesses uh, with obligations to shareholders. Some of them do see themselves as important actors in the public health ecosystem uh, in, in, in the world. So, so let me just get to a specific question. So how long would it take a country to build the facilities that it would take to produce these vaccines? Did you look at that? Uh, sure, yes. So how long would it take them to build the... Well, let me put it this way. Um, in order to for you to have access to the best information, I am probably the ne not the best uh, source uh, for the answers that you're looking for. Um, but let me just assure you, uh, yes, uh, we are looking at the full picture. We are looking at the IP piece and the WTO, but also in the context of uh, how... Um, uh, this and other actions will work together to translate into um, increased manufacturing, more equitable distribution. 
Well, my, Thank time, you. my time is up, uh, Mr. Chairman, but I just want to, my concerns on the record here about China being the only one to exploit the use of these vaccines. I just want to get that on the record, but I appreciate going over a little bit. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from California, Mr. Thompson, to inquire. Mr. Chairman, thank you, and thank you for holding uh, this uh, hearing today. Uh, welcome, Ambassador. Uh, we're pleased that you're with us, and we're delighted uh, that you're in the position that you're in. Uh, in my district, uh, tariffs are hammering our number one industry, which is uh, agriculture. Uh, the wine community in my district is being pulled into unrelated trade disputes after trade disputes, all that have nothing to do with them. Over the last few years, they've been targeted by Canada because of how we label meat, by China in the steel and aluminum dumping dispute, and by the EU over aircraft subsidies and digital service issues. Uh, I'm hopeful that the administration can bring some relief from these uh, existing tariff disputes and also make some forward progress for the wine community with a strong UK free trade agreement. Being able to eliminate tariffs for wine and add a robust wine index with the UK that removes the possibility of non-tariff barriers would bring a much needed win to our struggling producers. Similarly, a zero for zero agreement with the EU on wine would have the same positive impact for the US wine exports uh, that I represent as it did for spirit exports. Tariff-free access for wine would fix the current tariff imbalance that disadvantages our producers. This change is actually supported by wine producers in both the US and the EU. So hopefully uh, this is something that you can, uh, you can get done. Uh, Madam Ambassador, as one of the negotiators on the US MCA agreement, I, I thank you for the uh, commitment to using the new tools in that law to, uh, a max, to, a, to the maximum extent possible to protect American workers and American jobs from unfair trade practices. On another note, I appreciate how the pandemic has exacerbated trade issues and disrupted supply chains. This has a real life impact on my district where we just lost thousands of homes because of the deadly fires that we experienced. The surge in lumber prices is making it harder to rebuild. This is hurting real people already reeling from these fires. One way that we can help address this is by doing away with the tariffs on Canadian softwood lumber. Supply disruptions uh, aren't uh, limited to lumber. I continue to hear from constituents about supply chain and tariff issues that increase costs or make it just absolutely impossible to purchase things. Things as basic as bicycle parts, table lamps, and sporting equipment. I urge you to make sure trade policies are responsive to the realities our communities face and ensure that we are doing what we can to help bring about uh, relief. I appreciate the challenges facing you at USTR to rebuild uh, trade relations and to resolve the numerous trade issues that face our constituents. And I look forward to uh, hearing your thoughts on how the administration plans to address these issues that I've raised today. Mr. Thompson, it's nice to see you. Um, let me take up your issues uh, one by one. Uh, in terms of um, uh, the tariffs and your um, urging uh, me and USTR and this administration uh, to really uh, double down and work hard on resolving some of these disputes um, that have um, uh, uh, are, are being expressed right now through uh, tariffs. Um, uh, that is exactly what we are doing. Um, and I believe it was in early March, uh, we suspended on both sides the tariffs in the um, uh, ongoing uh, Boeing Airbus disputes with the European Union to create space for negotiating a resolution. Um, I'm very serious about accomplishing um, a resolution in these four months so that uh, we don't even need to uh, talk about whether or not uh, we would need to reintroduce the tariffs because we haven't met our goal. Um, I very much uh, am hopeful and will do everything that we can in our power um, to uh, make sure that we do arrive at the goal um, within this four month period. Uh, in, in terms of the other uh, disputes, um, uh, you're right. Uh, I just wanna say that uh, trade enforcement, um, the point of trade enforcement uh, isn't to get to the point where you can uh, punish um, uh, the other side 
uh, what you are trying to do always is to get to the point where you can negotiate a solution or an accommodation. And so I take your point that uh, uh, where we have uh, tariffs built up, um, the goal is to figure out uh, how to resolve our differences. Uh, on the UK, let me just say, um, um, very important strategic trading partner. Um, we are working with them in a number of areas, and the um, uh, trade agreement negotiations are uh, an important topic for us to keep working on with them. Uh, and in the other areas as well, let me just say, I, I really look forward to continuing to work with you um, on uh, your priorities and delivering for um, the American economy. Thank you very much, uh, Madam Ambassador, and I yield back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Florida, Mr. Buchanan, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador, congratulations. We look forward to working with you, and I think both sides are excited about the possibilities. Let me, uh, I want to touch on some different things. I'm a big, big believer in my life, 30 years in business, in planning. That means having some goals, some strategies, and just as important as any of that is having some sense of timelines. I don't know. I know these are complicated, so I don't want to uh, say uh, something that doesn't make sense, but let me just run through a few different things. In terms of TPP, it was something that blew up for various reasons, but I think we can have an improved version uh, what's there. I can tell you the past chairman, Paul Ryan, there was many of us that went to, met with five or six countries during that period of time, every one of them. Uh, we're concerned about China, the same, the same concerns that we've got today with China, and they all encouraged us and pretty much begged us that we need to get involved and we need to be engaged there in that part of the world. So I guess, what's your sense of TPP? Is that an opportunity? And if you can give us some sense, is that on your agenda? Because a lot of people think we're so preoccupied with the domestic agenda up here, but I would just encourage you, as you know, Trade, for example, in Florida, one out of five jobs is trade-related, 90 percent of the market's outside the U.S. So on TPP, and then I want to run through a few of these others, too. Mr. Buchanan, um, let, me, let me say this. Uh, in terms of uh, what TPP was trying to accomplish, its overall goals, which was to work with um, countries in the region um, that we have um, shared interests with, um, to uh, become closer with them and to um, uh, together uh, cooperate uh, to address challenges that are coming from China. Uh, those are uh, basic parameters uh, that are extremely important. Is there any sense of a timing or are you looking at it? I know you just got in the job, but I mean, is that something we're going to get later in the year? And the reason I'm going to say this is because I'm the Republican leader on trade. I want to help you help your agency, all of us do, to have a lot of success. But without some sense of the goals and the timeline, it's kind of hard to do that. But that's the mind sense I bring to there. But sure. uh, let me just move over quickly to, uh, we can talk a little bit more about TPP in a little bit. But the, the idea of TTIP or EU, as the chairman mentioned, you know, that's something when the Obama administration, his team was in Europe, I had a chance to meet with him over there. They were focused on that back then. I know it's not easy, but as uh, the chairman mentioned, we have a lot of shared values. That should be, you know, something that's a very high priority. What's your sense of your, your thoughts on that? And I know you touched on it a little bit. Is there any sense of a time frame or any idea from that where we're at there? In both cases, TPP and TTIP, let me just take these up together. Um, I feel like the we last had the pen on those in 2015, 2016. It's now 2021, and we've just come through a number of years uh, that have been um, uh, really impactful here, especially as it relates to trade policy. So uh, in terms of working with um, uh, countries in the Asia Pacific, working with the European Union, um, I am committed to figuring out how we, in 2021, uh, work together with them in a way that is relevant to the economy and the you know, one, political I'll situation. I want to touch base now. on two other quick things. The UK, uh, obviously, that's something I don't know we should be engaged now, and I'm sure you are to some extent, but I think that's a real opportunity. Uh, could you quickly comment on that? So, um, the UK negotiations, there were five rounds of negotiations over the course of last year, and as you know, the original objectives uh, for the negotiations came up in uh, uh, late 2018, I think. 
Um, in that time, the UK has finalized um, some of the terms of its exit from the EU. I think that it really is incumbent on us uh, here at the beginning of the administration um, to look really um, holistically at the objectives, at where we are now economically, where the UK is in its transition out of the EU. Ambassador, I got one more question. I want to be thoughtful is the yeah, bottom line. Yeah, and I want to visit with you on it more. Uh, I want to Kenya. I think there's a, a lot of bipartisan support. I can tell you there's almost a billion people in Africa today, as you know, and China is very active and engaged all over the continent. And I just think it's something we need to clearly look at. It uh, should be a little easier, but none of them are easy. But I think that's something that I, my sense, because we've had some meetings uh, that, and you were probably at them, but uh, that people are pretty open-minded to trying to do something more active on the continent because, again, China is very active and engaged. I've been to 15 countries there, or 10 countries, or whatever it is, a lot of countries, and pretty much every country they're building roads and they're building the, uh, government buildings and all this other things. So I, I think that's one that we need to stay focused on as well. But I look forward to working with you. Thank you, and, and uh, we'll see you shortly. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Connecticut, Mr. Larson, to inquire. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chairman, and uh, welcome, Ambassador. And uh, may I associate myself with the remarks of uh, Chairman Neal and uh, virtually everyone on both sides of the aisle and uh, recognizing uh, your uh, accomplishments, Ambassador, and also uh, our great faith in your ability. I just have two uh, questions for you. And um, I met recently with uh, M.D. Raman from Manchester, Connecticut, who uh, is a great story in and of himself, immigrated here from Bangladesh, and uh, he recently set up a vaccine clinic in Manchester on Delmont Street that is a model of how to get vaccines out in a community. And I visited and visited with those people who made a direct plea. Uh, and that's why I think your participation and this waiver to make sure that those citizens of uh, Bangladesh and India, uh, certainly both capable and needy, and needy can get uh, the vaccinations. This is a global pandemic. And uh, I think your actions are both appropriate and necessary and commend you and hoping you could comment on how you see things working out well, from that perspective. And also, uh, we couldn't be prouder of the fact of, uh, of uh, your position with regard to the Paris Accords. And I was wondering if you could provide a current state of uh, integration of the Paris Accords uh, with uh, USMCA and how Congress could help to support that. So two questions as they relate to uh, India and Bangladesh and uh, uh, vaccine relief and then the integration of Paris Accords uh, into the USMCA. Mr. Larson, let me take up your first question on uh, India, Bangladesh and uh, the, the WTO effort uh, to address um, um, the resolution of uh, restrictions uh, that may get in the way of uh, more broad and equitable <coughs> distribution of vaccines. Um, in terms of uh, what next and what our plan is, uh, our plan is to engage, uh, engage in good faith and to bring the sides together. Uh, the proponents in terms of what they need and what they've expressed as their goals, um, which we support, and also those who have not, um, who have not uh, um, uh, uh, come in yet or have not sat down at the table yet, to encourage them to roll up their sleeves and join us at the table um, uh, to uh, make the WTO relevant and to help save lives. Um, on your second question on the Paris Accords, um, I just wanted to say uh, uh, I will be seeing actually both of my counterparts uh, from Canada and Mexico next week at the convening of the Free Trade Commission under the USMCA. Uh, this is something that has to happen every year um, as the ministers come together uh, to review um, the, the, the health, if you will. It's a yearly checkup for the agreement. And um, I would be very pleased to um, continue to raise uh, this particular issue that you've brought up with uh, both of my counterparts. What a message of hope uh, would you bring uh, 
uh, back to uh, people who have relatives in India and Bangladesh. Uh, how hopeful are you of uh, these vaccines getting out in a timely basis uh, where they're desperately needed in those countries? Um, I am extremely motivated. Um, I'm very, I could not be more motivated, uh, and I am working in an administration of people who are not just motivated, but incredibly talented and very, very good at their jobs. Um, so, um, you know, uh, it's been a tough couple years for everybody in the world. Um, I just want to say, uh, let's all have hope. Uh, if we are positive and we are committed, um, humanity really can accomplish anything. Thank you so much, Ambassador, and I yield back my time. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Nebraska, Mr. Smith, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, certainly thank you, Ambassador Tai, and congratulations uh, again. I, I'll uh, echo what uh, everyone else has said. We're, we're grateful that you are there um, and that you're able to uh, bring your, your uh, ways and means background with you to such an important uh, position that you're in right now. Um, certainly appreciate the opportunity of working with you on USMCA. I, I think it's so important uh, with USMCA being probably the most bipartisan trade agreement, uh, certainly in modern history. Um, I, I think that uh, the momentum that that created with other uh, trade opportunities, I, uh, I'm sure you see that as an opportunity moving forward as we're looking at China, Japan, uh, UK, Kenya, uh, so many things. So that, that's why I'm hoping that uh, Trade Promotion Authority uh, can can be extended here as, as it is about to expire at the end of June. We're already in a time period now where um, uh, it's even without expiring, it does pose some challenges. And so uh, we know the TPA was was so important to teeing up the USMCA and that bipartisan opportunity to really strengthen trade uh, so that our producers, uh, whether it's agriculture, manufacturing, uh, other sectors of our economy, and benefit from trade. Now, more specifically on USMCA, uh, we're, we're now almost uh, a year in uh, since the agreement went into force, and it's obviously a landmark agreement accomplishing many things, uh, probably the, the most comprehensive enforcement provisions of any trade agreement, as you know. And I uh, very, am very specifically troubled by President Salvador for Mexico uh, with uh, his government adopting uh, the, uh, basically Europe's precautionary principle as the basis for rejecting uh, import permits and the delaying of uh, agriculture biotech product approvals, as well as a recent decree that would ban gen genetically modified corn and glyphosate. Uh, for Nebraska, this is incredibly troubling. Uh, we're the leading uh, white corn producer in the nation, and Mexico uh, takes on average 54% of the U.S. export of white corn over 90% of which is biotech. Nebraska is also a leading producer of food grade yellow corn production. So uh, looking at uh, the upcoming uh, USMCA Free Trade Commission meeting, uh, do you plan on raising this uh, with your counterparts? And more broadly, how do you plan to utilize the tools available to you under USMCA to resolve uh, these issues in a timely manner? Mr. Smith, it's great to see you. Um, I visited with um, Iowa corn growers uh, in the last um, week or so um, and um, uh, was really um, helped by them sharing their insights directly. Uh, I really appreciate you sharing um, the specifics in terms of uh, Nebraska corn as well. Uh, I, that is all to say that I am very aware of uh, the frustrations of our corn, gro corn growers uh, with um, access to Mexico's market. And yes, uh, yes, I, I, I do plan to raise this um, at uh, uh, the FTC uh, next week. And um, uh, we'll continue to work this issue along with all of the other issues that we need to work with Mexico and Canada um, to make progress uh, for our farmers, ranchers, workers, um, just for our uh, regular Americans um, who uh, work so hard uh, for their livelihoods. Thank you, and, and if you would uh, please keep uh, uh, me and my office apprised of what you're able to, to accomplish there. Uh, so I, I just can't express enough uh, how important it is that we move forward with 
uh, with, with these these opportunities that I that I see for expanding trade, I, I do want to um, express my concern about waiving the IP uh, issues surrounding pharmaceutical products. Um, I uh, some has already been mentioned and, and you've responded accordingly. Uh, I, I just want to express my concern that uh, we don't want to inadvertently empower some other countries uh, that, uh, that don't exactly engage in as much free trade as, as uh, we do or, or we would prefer they would. Uh, so I think waiving IP protections um, in support of forced technology transfer will, will result in, in uh, sharing commercially sensitive inf information with China, uh, perhaps some others. And uh, I, I just think we need to be extremely careful and very judicious uh, in that. And so I, I just wanted to add some emphasis there. And with that, I feel back. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the Trade Subcommittee Chairman, Mr. Blumenauer, to inquire. Thank you. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Madam Ambassador, welcome. It's so great to see you. I appreciate the ranking member's comments and the chair about Angela, who's going to be leaving us for a new assignment. I was very proud to watch the ranking member and the chair present you to the Senate Finance Committee uh, for your confirmation hearing. I mean, it's an example of how trade done right, I think, can actually bring us together rather than unnecessarily divide us. Uh, and you've been masterful in terms of helping this committee chart that path. Uh, I'm not going to engage with the ranking member about uh, what uh, mess the uh, Trump administration left you in terms of navigating trade agreements, frayed relationships, uh, incoherent tariff policies, and, and disruptions in markets, and abandoning opportunities to work cooperatively with international partners that agree with us. And I think you're in the process of reconstructing that, and I hope we can do that on a bipartisan basis. Uh, I strongly uh, disagree with the notion that somehow being able to deal with the TRIPS waiver is somehow abandoning uh, these uh, sensitive IP issues to the Chinese. The Chinese obsession from the previous administration prevented us from acting quickly and resulted, I'm convinced, in tens of thousands, maybe of hundreds of thousands of lives being lost. Your very careful modulated answer of how you're going to approach that in a partnership with industry, with other countries, in the WTO framework, I think is exactly how we'll be able to work moving this forward. Mr. Chairman, if you have no objection, I'd like to enter into the record uh, a letter with over 100 members of Congress supporting this process. With so ordered. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. And I must, of course, identify with my friend from California's uh, strong defense uh, of, in particular, the wine industry. We feel it here. But being able to sort through, I appreciate being able to use this four-month window to be able to have a thoughtful approach, to be able to unwind some of this, not have collateral damage at a time when we want to strengthen our economy and strengthen our markets. Uh, but I guess I would just want to focus for a moment in an area that I know is of deep concern to you in terms of how we're going to be able to pull the pieces together uh, dealing with the challenges that we have with China. I hope that, unlike the prior administration, we're not going to interfere with agricultural markets, we're not going to uh, uh, have this disruption in exchange for a purchase order, which may or may not be fulfilled, when we'd rather have people trading and engaging and pushing back on issues of forced labor, of inappropriate state subsidy, the overproduction in certain metals area that is creating this problem that you're, again, trying to unwind with the tariff policy. Would you like to comment for a moment on your thoughts about going forward dealing with China, intellectual property, and the trade disruptions that we've had in the course of the last four years. Absolutely. Thank you, Mr. Blumenauer. Um, in terms of the China challenge, I think that this is probably uh, one of uh, the most consequential, if not uh, the most consequential, 
uh, issue that we have to confront as we are looking at the future of the U.S. economy in the global marketplace. Um, the China challenge is large. Um, China moves fast. Um, uh, China has a very, very clear vision of where it wants to go. Um, we need to match uh, the competition that we are getting from China by having a clear vision about what kind of economy we want to have, what kind of strengths we have that we are going to build on, what kind of strengths we have that we still need to build on, uh, and um, how we are going to relate to China, first, if China can make changes, second, if China cannot make changes. Um, on uh, the question that you've asked, um, uh, you know, uh, regarding forced labor and um, the anti-competitive practices from China, whether it's subsidies or um, other types of practices that really create um, a global market domination uh, that drives out competition in economies like ours, uh, what I would say is this, that um, the, the U.S.-China trade and economic agreement, this phase one agreement that we have, uh, is the agreement that we have right now, uh, and it does have certain mechanisms that we will need to test out. But in terms of building on, uh, building out where we need to be with respect to China, uh, I am looking forward to working with you, the members of this committee, in the Senate, uh, and across the administration on how we best position the U.S. economy um, to uh, be strong, to run fast, uh, and to really um, come out ahead um, uh, after we come out of this pandemic and into the future. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I, I assure you that your old colleagues on the Trade Subcommittee are looking forward to being your best friend on Capitol Hill as we try and navigate these difficult challenges. Thank, Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New York, Mr. Reed, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and uh, I join with my colleagues, uh, Madam Ambassador, and wish you well, and I know you're going to be successful in working together. Uh, uh, I think your uh, tenure uh, in your position is going to be a, a very positive one. Uh, uh, that being said, I just want to take a moment and uh, use my time uh, to really quickly dive down into uh, a very concerning issue uh, to me, which is dairy access to Canada. Uh, we worked very hard in our office with many of, of my colleagues uh, on the committee and outside the committee in regards to the Canadian negotiations in particular. Uh, in regards to those sensitive issues about dairy access uh, to the Canadian market. And as the USMCA was uh, finalized, uh, it was very concerning to me uh, to see Canada, uh, in my humble opinion, not embrace uh, the, uh, the spirit as well as the terms uh, of the Canadian uh, portion of the agreement when it came to um, access uh, from our dairy producers, especially those uh, in our district. Uh, which uh, produces a tremendous amount of uh, cheese and other milk uh, um, um, products uh, for uh, quick, easy delivery to the Canadian uh, marketplace. So that being said, I was very pleased to see uh, uh, the Trade Office uh, pursue consultations uh, with Canada over this issue. And uh, I just wanted to get uh, your commitment uh, today to continue uh, to hold uh, Canada uh, to uh, those negotiated provisions. And also, uh, to get your read today um, as you um, sit here as to how those uh, consultations are going and uh, if the consultations are not going positively from your perspective, uh, when can we expect some type of additional actions to hold Canada to the, to the terms of the USMCA agreement? Thank you for your question, Nandari. Um, I am uh, very keenly aware of how important um, the dairy commitments that Canada made uh, were uh, to successfully closing out the USMCA negotiations. Um, I take these um, concerns that the U.S. dairy industry has extremely seriously. Uh, consultations continue. Um, as you know, the consultations um, uh, uh, translated from uh, one administration to the next. Um, I have raised this issue with my counterpart in Canada on my first call with her. Uh, I will continue to raise this, and um, we, will, uh, we will be conducting assessments at USTR in terms of what the best next steps are. And as I uh, have said to other members, and I am very happy to commit to you, uh, the tools that are in the USMCA are in there for a reason. They were to make the NAFTA better. Um, 
and they are to make this agreement work, and we must use those tools uh, because we have them. Uh, and because, frankly, we are committed to our partnership. So um, I, I hope that provides you with some assurance in terms of um, uh, how focused we are on this issue at USTR. Uh, that's very helpful, and I appreciate that, uh, Madam Ambassador. I look forward to working with you on this issue as well as many others. And with that, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Wisconsin, Mr. Kind, to inquire. Well, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Madam Ambassador, uh, so nice to welcome you back to the committee. You are uh, the right person in the right job with the right set of skills at the right moment and all of us look forward to working with you on a very robust and successful trade agenda as we move forward uh, i'd be remiss uh, if i didn't mention as a representative from wisconsin i share mr reed's sentiments in regards to dairy access to canada under usmca um, one of the great breakthroughs as you know well with the usmca was the enhanced enforcement provisions making it easier for us reps to sell the trade agreement to the constituents that we represent. So we'll look forward to working with you on that as we move forward. Uh, also, we will be uh, reintroducing the bipartisan WTO resolution shortly in committee. I know you're familiar with it because you and Ms. Ellard were very helpful in putting that together for us as we introduced it at the end of last year. So we'll look forward to working with you on the necessary reforms that we hope the WTO will be making to strengthen uh, the institution so we can resolve trade disputes peacefully uh, throughout the globe. Uh, also, I'm uh, co-chairing the US-UK Interparliamentary Working Group. And as Mr. Buchanan alluded, our top uh, priority is the bilateral trade negotiation that we hope to be able to move forward on. Of course, to Mr. Brady's point, we are gonna have to work on TPA authorization uh, in order to accomplish that. So we'll coordinate with the administration on the timing of when we can start moving forward on that front. Uh, but my question for you today, and you've heard it uh, previously, is the concern about the 232 tariffs. As you know, I and others were very displeased when the previous administration started slapping these 232 tariffs on our closest friends and allies, all under the guise of national security concerns. Um, and you know my sentiment towards trade. It's always been more than just goods and products and services crossing borders. It's an important part of our diplomatic and national security toolbox. And so I'm hoping that you will work aggressively and quickly in finding resolution to the 232 dispute with our closest uh, allies, especially in the EU with Great Britain uh, right now, because this is also having an economic uh, impact in Wisconsin from our bean producers to cranberry growers are feeling the impact. Harley Davidson teamed up with the representative Moore and sending you a letter on the impact on Harley in Wisconsin, can manufacturers, advanced manufacturers. So this is a real economic component as well. Can you give us any type of update? on how hopeful you are in being able to resolve the 232s uh, and also uh, your interest in working more closely with Congress. We have a greater say in the imposition of 232s and the reforms I think that need to be made based on bipartisan legislation that I and others have introduced in the past to give Congress a more meaningful role and voice before the imposition of 232s in the future. Congressman Kind, I um, actually, uh, it was my mistake not to have mentioned you in the earlier answer about dairy. Um, and so I'm glad that you have um, uh, um, endorsed um, uh, your interest in, in dairy as well. Um, on the 232s, uh, you're right. I know, I know um, uh, very much um, your interest in this issue um, and your interest in um, um, having a better way to go about trade enforcement. Um, let me just say this. I had an opportunity to talk about this yesterday at the Senate Finance Committee also, um, but um, let me elaborate some. Um, the 232 tariffs um, do come up on um, almost all of my calls with my foreign counterparts, uh, and so um, their concerns, um, they reinforce with me directly. Um, we have seen that the 232 tariffs have been effective in addressing an existential threat to our domestic steel and aluminum industries. Um, which have been facing global market distortions for over a decade. Uh, from my first tour through USTR, uh, we were having conversations about uh, the threat coming from uh, uh, this overbuilding of capacity uh, in China primarily, but, but not just in China and other countries as well. Uh, but we also know the 232 tools have their limitations. And so uh, what I want to do is, and uh, I look forward to um, working with you and others, um, 
I would really like to strengthen the trade tools that we have to address the problems that we have today. Uh, whether that is global overcapacity or other challenges that weren't contemplated 50 or 60 years ago when many of our trade statutes were drafted, we should plug in the gaps we see in countering the unfair trade practices we see today. And um, uh, what I really am doing is asking Congress to uh, work with me on uh, enhanced um, uh, relevant uh, trade tools. And um, if that is something yeah, that you're also interested in, I, I, I would like to work with you on it. Yeah, I, I did catch those previous remarks. We certainly are interested in engaging, but as you know, many of us are in regular communication with our EU counterparts and UK counterparts. So I encourage you to coordinate with us in uh, some way as far as where we're going with the 232s and uh, hope for resolution in the future. But thank you so much for your testimony and we look forward to working with you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Still thank back. you. Let me recognize the gentleman from Pennsylvania, Mr. Kelly, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Chairman. And Ambassador Tai, I, I, everybody's congratulating you. I want to thank you for taking this part of your life to actually come and do what you're doing right now because it's one of those things that uh, trade is, it's truly, uh, all of us are interested in it, but sometimes we get into this, we get wrapped around the axle on the political end of these things as opposed to true policy. Uh, I'm an America first person just because I'm an American. Uh, I find it interesting that, that sometimes we, we have a blind eye to what's been taking place in the world as we've continued to lose market share year after year, decade after decade, and lose our ability. In the area that I come from, people talk about steel. They talk about Pittsburgh. Uh, they talk about the steelers, and everything's about steel. Steel's incredibly important to us. Ag is the number one business in Pennsylvania, especially hardwoods. I know right now we're hearing this com the conversation now about the price of softwoods has gone up 400%. I have friends in the hardwood business who have had product uh, offshore that was shipped to China but was never allowed to be delivered. So we look at all these different, different issues that we have. And I got to tell you, the United States Steel actually, they were in a point, they were going to invest $1.5 billion in the Mon Valley. They've gone away from that investment right now because it doesn't look like it makes sense to invest now because there'd be no return on that investment. The only thing, uh, and people have been telling you about their pet uh, concerns, and I, uh, listen, there's not one concern that any of us should not share for any part of the marketplace. And I think that sometimes, again, I'm going to go back to it. If we, if we can't get by the political part of this and just get to straight policy, because what I'm talking about now are jobs, American jobs, America's position in the marketplace, America's ability to defend herself with other things that take place in the world where we get games so often. I talked to you on the phone the other day about grain-oriented electric steel, what's called GOES. Right? This is the product that goes inside transformers that help us move electricity around the country. The last producer of grain-oriented electric steel in the United States is a half a mile from the dealership that I've been in all my life, the automobile dealership. Those are 1,400 jobs. More importantly, it is a national security problem when in the future, the United States, if they do not have the ability to produce their own products and rely on a foreign source as we have seen happen during this pandemic, it's like, you know, it's time to take off the dunce cap and understand why this happened. So I am going to be relying on you. I have no request from you today other than to thank you for what you're doing. And I would hope that all of us come together with the idea that the market share we lost, and a lot of it is because of our own policies where we have made it impossible for our manufacturers to compete globally by domestic policy. That is really hard to understand. I've watched it happen in the automobile industry, and it goes back to decisions that were made by people who were in a position to make decisions but didn't have an idea of what the outcome of those decisions would be. America cannot afford to lose any more market share globally. So I am with you on everything and also my colleagues when it comes to protecting American jobs, American manufacturing, America's position in the world. That is my number one concern. It has nothing to do with red or blue, Republican or Democrat. It is a red, white, and blue initiative that I'm glad we're going to have an opportunity to work with you on. So I thank you for your service. I thank you for your commitment. And you could be doing a lot of other things. And I've told Angela many times, why do you stay here? You could, do, you could make so much more money going into the private sector. And it's because of love of country. So I would hope that this panel 
and everybody else that serves in this Congress would understand that our love of America should far outweigh any type of a political difference we have. Policy for the USA is the policy that we all should be working on. I thank you for your service. And Chairman, I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from New Jersey, Mr. Pasquel, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. I want to associate myself with the words of Mr. Kelly. He can make sense. I guess it doesn't belong here if it makes sense. It makes sense to me. And I want to welcome the ambassador back. Uh, we're proud of you. And you are missed already. It's no secret to you that my focus continues to be the new NAFTA. The deal was supposed to break government-connected protection unions. I, mean, I, re I read the words of the debates, and uh, you don't have to become any kind of a wizard, which I'm not, to understand that that was a major focus of many of our remarks. And their crooked corporate connections, because they've escaped from these discussions over the past 10 years. What's the responsibility of the corporations in how we deal with one another? And they need to stand up and take the responsibility somewhat with us. And I hope during your tenure that you will not be a mouthpiece for any administration, but give us your independent thoughts, but they've been pretty good in the past. I'll rely on those. But there have been over 830 votes since this deal was signed. Only two protection unions have been overturned, two in one year. That is less than one half of 1%. There are continued reports of intimidation, of harassment, retaliation. In fact, we know that in one of the unions, the attorney was not only fired, but harassed, et cetera, et cetera. And I predict that that's going to be a very fundamental issue, whether it goes to trial or not. I think it's fundamental. Um, workers lawfully seek independent representation in Mexico. And then we find out a lot of these companies are owned by folks in Canada. Thank you for following our lead to denounce the loathsome labor rights violations at General Motors, the plant in Cielo, Mexico, and the labor community's case against Tridonex on Monday ratchets up the pressure. Thank you for your thoughts and your words. The last administration couldn't be bothered to do the bare minimum for workers. No evidence of that whatsoever. You were influential in dragging them, kicking and screaming to support real enforcement. Spent a lot of time discussing that. So I believe workers are in good hands with you at the helm. If you can't secure a victory for workers, I don't know who could. And I got along very well, and we all did, with Mr. Lighthouse. I thought he did a pretty good job entering us into the real gut actions and talking about protecting workers, both in Mexico, Canada, and the United States. And I think Mr. Kelly should think about, and we should discuss together, what trade has to do with exporting jobs from the United States to other countries. We can't, we're afraid to talk about that, because as soon as we talk about that, we're talking about corporate responsibility. We don't want to talk, we don't want to touch it. Democrats and Republicans, not just Republicans. In Europe, in your upcoming meeting with your Canadian and Mexican counterparts, will you commit to raising these two labor cases? Yes, sir. Will you push your Mexican counterparts to improve the legitimization of protocols as outlined in the December Independent Mexico Labor Expert Board Report? I plan to do that, yes. 
I believe strongly our trade policies must address the threat of climate change. On January the 19th, 122 House members joined me in calling on the Biden administration to work with Canada and Mexico to include the Paris Agreement in the renegotiated NAFTA. In your upcoming meeting with Canada and Mexico, will you raise the prospect of amending the list of multilateral environmental agreements covered by the renegotiated NAFTA to include the Paris Agreement? Mr. Pascrell, I think that would be a great opportunity to do so. Thank you, and I appreciate your answers. And Mr. Chairman, I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Missouri, Mr. Smith, to inquire. We will come back to Mr. Smith. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. LaHood, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and Ambassador Tai, welcome. Um, congratulations um, on your new position, and I think it speaks volumes about you and your prior work that you were, I think, confirmed by the Senate 98 to nothing, uh, and had Mr. Brady and Chairman Neal there to introduce you. So look forward to uh, continuing to work with you. I want to talk a little bit about China. Um, if I understand your testimony correct, there are a number of different top-to-bottom reviews as it relates to China. If I understand it, DOD has a review going on, there's a supply chain review going on, and if I understand your testimony, USTR is doing a review of that. Um, so I wanted to see how those three are coordinated together, and then if you can elaborate a little bit on, on what's your sense of that review, what it will entail, what are the metrics that you're going to use to analyze the policy and the time frame for completion? Mr. LaHood, thank you. Um, this is uh, obviously another area that we are um, very focused on and spend a lot of our time um, working on. Um, I think that um, uh, in terms of uh, terminology, we are talking about our review at USTR as the top to bottom China review. But you're right, there are several, there are several reviews going on at the same time. Uh, let me distinguish the one that we are undertaking um, just by saying that this is uh, to look at the U.S.-China trade and economic relationship through the lens of USTR. Uh, and it was really on the recommendation um, and request of uh, Senator Portman, uh, an alum of this committee and also a former U.S. trade representative, uh, to undertake uh, this kind of a review, which um, uh, he had led at USTR when he was the trade rep uh, back in 2005, 2006, um, after uh, China had uh, been in the WTO for a couple of years. Um, I think that this is, a, this is a really important opportunity for us to um, undertake a comprehensive review of the U.S.-China trade and economic relationship as it is today with reference to um, the last review that was conducted 16 years ago um, uh, and to um, look at all the components of the U.S.-China trade policy, including the uh, phase one agreement, including the tariffs, including the exclusions, um, and um, really um, have this opportunity to strategically think through what are the components going to be of an effective strategy? What in what we have right now is effective? What could be more effective? And how do we turn the direction of this very important challenge um, towards a vision that is going to serve the interests of the U.S. economy today in the medium term and also in the long term. In terms of your specific question and how we're coordinated, uh, USTR plays a role in the interagency review on supply chains. Um, that is primarily uh, driven by a number of other um, uh, agencies, but clearly USTR equities and insights and experience um, are a critical part of that review. And so uh, we participate uh, very robustly in bringing our expertise to that conversation. Uh, on DOD's review, um, that is DOD's review, but we do have opportunities um, uh, regular opportunities for our teams to be connecting to apprise each other of updates and directions so that so that we're not doing this left hand right hand left leg right leg that we're really taking the opportunity to look at this in a comprehensive way because that's the opportunity we have right now to try to get this right uh, thank you for that um, back when um, secretary yellen was going through her confirmation she described China as engaging in abusive, unfair, and illegal practices when it comes to the economy. Do you agree with that? 
Yes. And she also described horrendous human rights abuses by the Chinese. You agree with that? Yes. Um, in terms of the full array of tools that we have when it comes to China, uh, tariffs, sanctions, what are those other tools uh, that, that are in the toolbox that you'll be looking at? Well, another um, important tool that we have is that um, uh, forced labor import ban uh, that I know members of this committee have been very engaged in trying to strengthen with respect to uh, goods made through forced labor um, uh, coming into the United States. Um, in terms of other tools, uh, let me say this, and, and this will reference a bit um, uh, Mr. Kelly's intervention, which is um, in terms of anti-competitive practices that have really hurt US, the U.S. economy, jobs, uh, our manufacturing capacity, our competitiveness, um, we have seen um, the, the harm that has played out over the last 15, 20 years, maybe even longer, what we also know is that these patterns are going to keep playing themselves out. So steel and GOES are an example. Um, um, solar modules is another example. And then as we look at China's industrial policies, we can see where uh, the next um, uh, set of um, uh, anti-competitive um, uh, challenges are going to be. Um, I think we need tools that are not just about responding to harms that we have experienced in the past, but tools that are going to anticipate where we're going to have the same pattern of harm to allow us to get ahead of the harm uh, and allow us to respond as effectively as possible. Mr. Chairman, can I ask one quick follow-up question? In terms of those array of tools, um, should the boycotting in the Olympics be one of those tools? So on that, um, uh, I'm not sure. I haven't been thinking about that tool as um, s strictly in the trade and economic policy lane. I think that there's a lot more involved there. I know we've talked about this earlier as well, and um, it's an area where I know the State Department leads, and um, uh, it's something that I will raise uh, with um, uh, Secretary Blinken um, when I do speak to him next. Thank you. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentleman from Illinois, Mr. Davis, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and congratulations, Ambassador. And I first of all want to commend you and the administration for the considerations that you've given to the waiver dealing with intellectual property, especially as we view the pandemic as a global pandemic and the fact that our country can be helpful to other nations. I find that to be quite commendable. I was pleased to see the administration announce the COVID-related list of exclusions earlier this year. As schools and businesses reopen, it seems more important than ever that some additional products be added to the list. I represent a company that designs and manufactures portable air purification systems. The CDC and the EPA have highlighted the importance of air purifiers in combating COVID indoors, including for schools as they reopen. However, these products are still subject to a 25% tariff. And I guess my question becomes, what additional procedural steps will the administration take to have as much transparency and fairness, whatever we describe fairness in the end to be, in the exclusion process? Congressman Davis, thank you for the yes. question. Yes. Yes. Um, let me let me um, um, be responsive to your question. Um, with respect to the exclusions, um, this is one component of our uh, top to bottom China review. And um, let me say this: I don't want to I don't want to prejudge um, the outcome of the review, but obviously uh, this is going to be an important component. And, and obviously, I know from the job that I had working for this committee, and also the job that I have right now, um, I'm keenly aware of. Um, 
the uh, concerns that have been raised by those trying to make use of the exclusion process about the exclusion process in terms of transparency uh, and fairness um, and predictability of the process. So um, uh, I guess what I would say is as part of our review, um, we will need to hear from all of those voices um, here in Congress and also out there in the economy in terms of their experience with this process uh, as we assess um, how we can uh, improve and make more effective um, our China trade policies. Let me ask, in, in responding to a question for the record submitted by the Senate Finance Committee, you stated that trade negotiations should not prioritize one stakeholder over another, and agricultural trade outcomes should not come at the expense of others in agriculture. At one time, Chicago was known as the candy capital of the world. However, many of our sugar-using manufacturers have relocated to South America and Canada due to the sugar program, and more importantly, the tariff rate quota. What are your thoughts about our sugar situation at the moment? And is there a way that we might encourage a more balanced sugar policy? Mr. Davis, I know um, no one knows more about candy um, than you do. Uh, and so um, let me just say um, I would be very interested in um, continuing this conversation and having my team dig in with yours. Uh, about where um, opportunities may lie. Thank you so much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman. I have five questions I'll submit for the record, and I yield back. So ordered, and let me recognize the gentleman from Arizona, Mr. Schweikert, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And Madam Ambassador, um, first I owe you a thank you for um, all your work in helping uh, Mr. Kind and those of us who are interested in the WTO, we'll call it resolution. Um, but this becomes one of those moments now that you're behind that dais. Um, if you were dra redrafting it again today, would you draft it differently? Well, that's a great question, uh, Mr. Schweikert, and um, I, would, I could probably write you an essay about this, but I know we've just got a little time, so let me say this. Um, we can't go back in time, but today where we are in 2021, um, yes, I think that the fundamentals of the WTO itself needs reform uh, and needs to reflect the realities of today. And I rarely get anyone who says that was a good question, so now I'm all giddy. Um, but, but for many of us here, um, and um, uh, Representative Kind and his staff, we've had this running conversation. It's both the adjudicatory body, as I mispronounce it, but for many of us, in partic particularly, it's speed. I actually truly believe in the coming decade the disputes are going to be on things from synthetic biology to things that are truly cutting edge but very disruptive to the economy. But speed will be crucial, and you can't have a decade of the games going back and forth, and by the time you actually come to a decision, the economics of the dispute are gone. What can we do? Um, you know, we have, you know, we're joyed to have, gonna have a friend there in the body, with your understanding of our concerns, what, is, what can we as members of Congress do to help the argument that the reforms of the WTO also have to be about the timelines? These timelines can't be a decade anymore. Congressman, um, I think that um, uh, the number one thing that you can do is what you are doing right now, which is to be deeply engaged. It matters so much uh, for U.S. leadership and U.S. participation at the WTO, um, for the WTO and its members to know that the United States cares, that it's not just USTR, it's not just the executive, uh, but that um, uh, U.S. participation and leadership is backed up by congressional interest um, and um, uh, congressional um, uh, requirements. 
Um, with respect to the dispute settlement system, I hear you on speed. I mean, you know, the large civil aircraft cases, Boeing Airbus that we've had, uh, were first launched in the mid-2000s. Um, that is part of what is motivating me in really uh, putting uh, the nose to the grindstone with the European Union to try to resolve these cases now. Um, it's in part to show that uh, all of this time has led to something, that this hasn't been uh, just a colossal waste of time. Um, uh, I think that there are other aspects to dispute settlement that we really need to think about and we really need to think holistically about dispute settlement, not just as one part of the WTO, uh, but one key component uh, that is important for itself, but that also directly impacts the other part, which is the negotiating function. Uh, as strong as the dispute settlement system has become, it has taken a long time, um, it has become uh, very active, um, we have also seen an atrophying of the negotiating function. These two things are connected. But, but, but is there way, I mean, there's some articles out there that talk about everything from a, you know, a, a, a quick ruling, an escrow, then continued dispute, um, something it forces more pressure, more value for actually the negotiations to come to a close. And do we need to produce some mechanism that, that um, uh, creates almost a leverage that you will negotiate in good faith to a final decision instead of the game that appears to be going on now where make it take forever and at that point, what if it's an IP type case or those things, the value of it has already faded away. I like the way you're thinking about it and I would really like to continue to work with you and others on this committee um, on some of these ideas. You're very kind. Um, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentleman. Let me recognize a gentlelady from California, Ms. Sanchez, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman and Ambassador Tai. Thank you for joining us today. It really is a pleasure to see you here. I know that you've dedicated most of your career to public service, and it's great to see you breaking barriers for women of color at every step. And it's particularly great to see you lead the office of the U.S. Trade Representative. I very much am looking forward to partnering with you to build a more equitable and worker-focused trade agenda. Um, I want to start my questions by turning to an issue that you are no doubt very familiar with, the USMCA. I know that you spent countless hours strengthening the USMCA uh, to incorporate changes that have powered our economy and meaningfully benefited workers. And now you are charged with implementation, implementation rather, of key labor issues that you worked very hard on, including the rapid response mechanism. I want to first uh, begin by expressing my support for your actions to proactively use the rapid response mechanism. As I'm sure you're aware, earlier this week, the AFL-CIO, SCIU, Public Citizen, and Independent Mexican Trade Union, CINITES, filed their first complaint under the rapid response mechanism. And without enforcement, our trade agreements really aren't worth the paper that they're written on. So I know that you, you are working to try to uh, make sure that our partners are meeting their obligations under the USMCA. Um, you, uh, Ambassador Tai, you mentioned in your testimony that support from Congress can help us deliver results for the American people. And I'm interested in knowing how can we partner with your office to ensure that Mexican employers and government officials are meeting their obligations under USMCA and they are respecting worker rights. Well, Congressman, thank you so much for your kind words, but also thank you for raising this particular question because I think that um, one of the um, uh, most direct ways that you can partner with us is by raising uh, your priorities and your concerns and expectations um, at this hearing. Um, I will be meeting, as I noted earlier, with my uh, Mexican and Canadian counterparts next week at the first uh, uh, Free Trade Commission meeting um, uh, under the USMCA, um, and uh, uh, it is incredibly helpful to me to be able to point to this exchange that we are having right now uh, to demonstrate uh, the credibility of everything that I represent in terms of uh, what the priorities are and what the expectations are of uh, members of Congress um, who supported this agreement, uh, who really need for the agreement to deliver on its promises. Great, thank you. Um, I now want to turn to another issue that has a great impact on jobs and workers in my district. Uh, my district neighbor, uh, neighbors the port of Long Beach, which is a source of tremendous deal of economic activity. Um, but the pandemic has shown disruptions to supply chains and particularly 
our over-reliance on China, which can impact our local economy and our workers. I understand that you are conducting a full review of the U.S.-China trade relationship, and I commend that, um, because the last administration relied only on using tariffs to address our ongoing trade issues with China. And I heard some of your testimony earlier. I agree that we have to be creative and we have to use more than just tariffs to address the economic harms of Chinese trade policy. So I would love to work with you on identifying additional tools to defend against China's unfair trade practices, um, particularly you know, their reliance on forced labor. And I agree that pers prospective strategies that can stop China from undermining the integrity of our supply chains are needed. So I just wanna mention that. And then lastly, I'd like to turn to the issue of trade agreements as a way to promote equity in developing um, and trade partner countries. Our trade agreements have historically increased inequality in other countries, in Mexico, Central American countries, and other trade partners. And those findings are well documented, including in a Ways and Means Equity Report that was released earlier this year. So Ambassador Tai, you have unprecedented opportunity to change course and promote inclusive democracies, improve working conditions, and promote racial and gender justice through our trade agenda. So I am curious if you can identify for me some existing tools that you will use to help us better achieve those goals. Congressman, um, this is such an important question. Um, as I've talked about before, uh, we really have an opportunity right now um, to uh, build better trade policies that are more inclusive, that are just more conscious of the fact that um, the benefits of trade need to be more widely shared and need to be directly relatable to um, more people. Um, the more that we can do that for ourselves through our trade agreements and then for our partner countries, the more durable these agreements are and the more they are a force for good. Uh, which I don't think has always been the case that our trade agreements have been viewed as forces for good here or in our partner countries. So um, I think uh, we need to be we need to be conscious uh, of what our goals are, um, and uh, we need to have uh, data and um, policies, uh, really innovative policies, to incorporate into um, a tradition that we are inheriting in terms of uh, trade agreements and trade policies. Um, there is such an opportunity for innovation right now, and I look forward to continuing this conversation with you and this committee. I know it is a priority, um, and it's an opportunity that we really have to seize. I thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Indiana, Ms. Walarski, to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Ambassador Tai, it is so good to see you. Congratulations. I want to add, um, like all of my colleagues, and to Angela as well, two strong women leading in um, such an important position in this country. Um, you know, I don't think there's um, any time that trade has ever been more important than it is right now, and I'm so glad you're there, and I'm, and I'm so glad for your openness. I look forward to working with you um, as well on the resolution of 232. I won't go into the details of it because we've talked about it, but um, that's a, an issue in my district as well. On 301 exclusions, um, I, along with a bipartisan group of over 100 of my colleagues in the House, recently sent you a letter requesting that USTR start that exclusion process. In addition, I would urge you to restore all the lapsed 301 exclusions in order to provide relief to U.S. businesses and their workers in the immediate term. I've heard of many instances where companies and their workers are being disadvantaged by these tariffs because they manufacture here in the United States. This is an urgent matter in my world. Without targeted relief, these tariffs will hurt our economic recovery. Another important issue is renewing GSP as quickly as possible. Its lapse is currently hitting manufacturers in my district, such as the RV industry, to the tune of $1 million per month. And I know my constituents are not the only ones feeling this kind of pressure. Mr. Chairman, I hope you and I can work together to get GSP as well as MTB across the finish line. Lastly, I want to touch on a proposal circulating the WTO seeking to waive intellectual property protections for COVID-19 vaccines and other treatments. I've seen little evidence on an NIP waiver will increase the global availability of the vaccine since so many of these countries are ill-equipped to produce the vaccine without technical support from the manufacturer. I also don't understand the rationale of giving away American intellectual property to our economic and national security competitors like China. 
And if providing vaccines worldwide is the administration's goal, there are other ways to achieve it without undercutting the companies that have invested the resources and the hard work in developing these vaccines and other treatments to fight the pandemic. I support efforts to accelerate production and distribution of vaccines and other COVID-19 response items, but don't believe that this is the right approach. My first question, Ambassador Tai, so are you planning to restart the 301 exclusion process? And are you willing to restore the expired exclusions while that process gets in operation again? And then on a related note, what can we expect, when can we expect the, the administration to complete its broader China review? Thank you, Congresswoman. On the 301 exclusions, um, it will be part of our top to, top, uh, top to bottom China review. And so, um, uh, as I know that you know, and thank you very much for the letter uh, that you sent. Um, uh, these letters are uh, important. We read them very carefully, and we think through our responses um, uh, pretty carefully, too. Um, <clears throat> Uh, most of the exclusions had expired at the end of last year, uh, and um, uh, the posture that we have adopted, again, um, wanting to be maximally thoughtful and taking uh, advantage of the opportunity that we have right now at the beginning of the administration is uh, we will be undertaking um, uh, the question of the tariffs, uh, examining them, uh, examining the uh, exclusion process together. I know time is of the essence. I absolutely, I, uh, I feel it, um, the urgency uh, in terms of those in our economy who are just um, um, wanting to bounce back and uh, who work so hard. So um, <clears throat> my commitment to you is that uh, this is one of our top priorities. We have uh, so many of the really talented and hardworking folks at USTR working on this, and I hope to be able to come back to you soon with more specifics. I know how important this is to you, to others, and to small businesses, large businesses, and uh, workers in America. I appreciate it. <clears throat> My final question is, um, what's your perspective on the implementation of the US-China phase one trade deal in terms of medical devices, which were included in the deal's purchase commitments? So um, this uh, um, trade deal uh, is also, uh, we have been um, uh, conducting an ongoing assessment of China's performance. Um, and it's uh, it's mixed. It's mixed. Um, with respect to your specific question on the medical devices, uh, let me go back and check so that I make sure um, uh, I'm working with the most updated uh, data, which is always a little bit of a lag, um, and get you um, a good answer on this as opposed to just what my impression is. I right so now. much appreciate it. Thank you so much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. I thank the, the gentlelady. Now, consistent with committee practice, we will move to a two-to-one questioning ratio, beginning with the gentleman from New York, Mr. Higgins. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you for being here, Ambassador. It's wonderful to see you. As I said before, you're a great source of pride for this committee and a great source of joy for all of those who you've worked with and who admired your work here and continue to admire the work that you're doing as the United States Trade Representative. In 1960, the United States economy was 40% of the world economy. In 1960, China was 6% of the world's economy. Today, the United States is 24% of the world's economy. China is 19% of the world's economy. Uh, China is growing global market share. America is declining in global market share. 40 years ago, the US-China competition was for who would make the world's toys, T-shirts, and tennis shoes. Today, the U.S.-China trade competition is about who will lead in technology, in 5G broadband, artificial intelligence, computer chips, pharmaceuticals, and electric vehicles. Today, 80% of the electric vehicles are either made in China or in Europe. Despite this, 71% of U.S. drivers say that they want an electric vehicle. 50% of American drivers cite lack of charging stations as a major obstacle to buying electric vehicles. The Biden administration has proposed an aggressive electric vehicle strategy by building 500,000 charging stations by the year 2030. Can you talk about that goal and the importance relative to the U.S.-China uh, relationship as it relates to uh, the economy. Congressman Higgins, um, thank you for that set of statistics. I think that it does paint um, a very um, uh, stark picture. 
um, about uh, uh, where we've come from, uh, where we are right now. But um, I also think that it paints um, and sets up a, a really um, a motivational picture, too, in terms of where we can go. Um, I talked in my opening statement about um, the need to level the playing field, uh, to have fair trade, uh, and to have compliance with international norms and rules. Uh, and I've talked quite a bit with a lot of your colleagues on the committee about um, uh, robustly using the tools that we have and then needing new tools. Um, I'll go back to a, a framework that I found very useful, which is in terms of leveling the playing field um, and uh, enforcing um, uh, fair trade, those are really defensive tools. Those are you know, to push back on um, uh, practices and impacts of policies uh, that have a negative effect on us. Um, we can't just play defense. We need a very, very strong offense. And to your point about uh, infrastructure, about looking forward in terms of the kind of economy we can have, the kind of leadership that we can maintain in the global marketplace and in terms of um, the industries of the future, uh, that is what all of this is about right now. We have an opportunity, and um, whether it's infrastructure or other kinds of investments, uh, that is as key a part of our China strategy as all of the defensive trade tools that I've been talking about today. Just as uh, looking at this another way, um, electric vehicles are essentially computers with wheels. There's no longer a gas-fueled internal combustion engine that relies on foreign oil. If you look at the entirety of the Middle East, it has a population of about 300 million people, approximately the same size of the United States. You take oil out of the equation, the entirety of the Middle East exports an amount equivalent to Finland, to Finland. So, Moving toward electric vehicles is not only good for the good that it does for the consumers that want those products, but it's also good for the national security of this country. In the past two decades, the United States has spent $6.5 trillion in Middle East wars in Iraq, Afghanistan, and Pakistan. I would argue that we would not have gone in so aggressively had we had independence from our addiction to the oil that they produce. So I think there's another component as to why we need to be aggressive about pursuing electric vehicles in this country. With that, I yield back. Thank you. I thank the gentleman. Let me recognize the gentlelady from Alabama, Ms. Sewell, to inquire. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. And welcome back, Ambassador Tai. I like the ring of that. <laughs> I want to say that I enjoyed working with you, not only as a member of this committee, but also working with you on USMCA. I can think of no one who has a stronger background in trade uh, and who um, ha is, has such political prowess and great negotiating skills. And I wish you well and look forward to working with you. Uh, Chairman Neal uh, chose me as one of the co-chairs of the Racial Equity Initiative. and. I think that we have a real um, opportunity uh, with this administration and you at the helm to really address some of the um, structural inequities uh, that, affect, that affect trade. And so I know that this administration is laser focused on equity um, and would love to know your thoughts about what we can do specifically at this moment in time to address um, the inequities uh, that exist in underserved communities um, as when it comes to trade. Um, and I, I specifically would like to talk to you about um, what we can do as, in terms of having better trade um, and more fair trade for our workers, but also opportunities for um, underserved communities to really um, become, uh, you know, more engaged when it comes to the ability to provide um, uh, trade opportunities for, for, those, uh, for those people who live in those communities. Congresswoman, it's so nice to see you, um, and it's such an um, uh, honor um, to uh, talk about this issue with you, uh, given the priority that I know this committee places on um, the issues of equity um, and trade policy and how seriously we take this at USTR. 
Um, there are actually a lot of aspects to what we're doing at USTR that I think complement very well uh, what I understand all of you are doing here at Ways and Means, and um, I look forward to enhancing that partnership um, so that we can coordinate uh, better and um, to keep each other informed uh, and form some synergies. Uh, but let me just point to one specific concrete thing that we are doing right now, which relates to our um, engagement approach and our engagement strategy, which is um, if we want trade policies to work better for our workers, uh, for regular people, uh, for wage, owner, wage earners, sorry, um, <clears throat> what we need to do is to um, uh, talk to uh, regular people. We need to reach out to people in communities that we haven't traditionally and that um, uh, most trade policymakers uh, don't naturally think of. If we want um, the office of the U.S. Trade Representative to represent the interests of the United States, we have to do more of an effort to uh, reach out to uh, to know what is in the interests of the United States. We can't just sit here in Washington waiting for the U.S. to come to us. If we do that, then we really are trapping ourselves in a kind of a pattern uh, where only um, the most sophisticated, uh, most well-resourced parts of America get a say in our trade policies. And um, we have to do better. Uh, we have to do better uh, for the United States. We have to do better for um, our, our regular Americans and our workers. Absolutely. Um, with that said, I think that uh, when we as policymakers start thinking about how we can be more equitable uh, and leveling the playing field in trade, um, have you all thought about uh, ways that we can make our trade adjustment pro uh, policies as well as um, enforcement tools better? I think one of the big uh, highlights uh, from the USMCA was the rapid response uh, as a tool. And I think that, um, you know, I commend your announcement yesterday, but I also think there are ways that we uh, put in the USA, USMCA that are not, that are not as well known, like um, being the hotline and other things that we're, we've we've done to try to make it, things more equitable. Um, can you talk a little bit about some of the unknown or or less known uh, tools um, that can promote better accountability, more transparency, and more um, ability to enforce uh, these important uh, these important uh, rules? Absolutely, Congressman, thank you for this opportunity. And I think that um, you have highlighted some of the most um, important and innovative parts of the USMCA. Uh, but let me just uh, elaborate on some of them. I think with respect to that rapid response mechanism, um, the timelines and um, the specific requirements um, uh, under uh, that mechanism uh, are designed to uh, improve transparency, to invite participation. Uh, to reflect um, um, uh, engagement and input uh, from those who I think uh, in, in normal traditional trade agreements um, are not and do not feel empowered uh, to engage. Um, so those are some of the examples, but um, uh, Congressman Sewell, um, uh, let's definitely uh, work together. Um, uh, we would be very, very excited to enhance our work um, uh, in this area uh, with um, you and the Council. Thank the gentlelady. Let me recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice, to inquire. Mr. Rice, would you unmute, please? Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Uh, and Ambassador Knight, what a pleasure to have you in front of the committee. Thanks, and congratulations on your appointment. Uh, I think the country is well served. I want to talk to you specifically about the 232 tariffs. Uh, it, I'm certainly a proponent of free trade, but it has to be fair. And uh, China has, despite the, the, the uh, I'm sorry, Mr. Rice, I don't mean to interrupt. You're actually breaking up quite a bit, and um, I, I can't quite understand what you're saying, so I don't want to get to the awkward part where you get to the end of your question and I'm just staring at you blankly. Okay, can you hear me better now? Thank you so much, yes. No? You can? Okay. Uh, so, you know, one of the reasons for in income inequality spread in this country that we so constantly fret about 
justifiable is globalization and uh, and the China stealing our intellectual property and su illegally subsidizing industries that undercut American industry and undercut American workers, like steel, for example. When China builds excess capacity, uh, they're willing to, the government subsidizes these industries, willing to take a loss to ultimately eliminate competition in other Tom, so, Tom, Tom, we're having trouble hearing you. Um, all I can tell you, I could log off and log back on. Why don't you go on to somebody else and I'll come back. We'll come back to you. Is that all right, Tom? Yes. Okay. The gentleman from New York, Mr. Swazi, is recognized to inquire. Thank you very much, Mr. Chairman, and thank you, Congresswoman Del Bene, for letting me jump the line here. I appreciate it very much. Ambassador Tai, it is just such a great pleasure to listen to you. Uh, you really are a diplomat, and you're doing a fantastic job in the position, and we couldn't be more excited uh, that you're playing this role for our country. Um, I serve on the uh, Congressional Executive Commission on China, uh, and I've been asked recently by some Uyghur advocates to form a Uyghur caucus uh, in the Congress, which I am in the process of putting together. Uh, so ever since the 1970s, and uh, President Nixon went to China, we've always believed here in this country that the more that China was exposed to our way of life, uh, the more they'd become like us as far as uh, capitalism, as far as democracy. Uh, that clearly just hasn't happened. And as many of previous speakers and you have mentioned, uh, we're in a real strategic competition with China right now, and they are doing pretty well. Uh, they're taking over much more of the global share of the economy. Uh, they are breaking the rules, I believe. They're cheating when it comes to uh, so many different issues with trade and uh, intellectual property. But my biggest concern that I have right now is about their human rights violations, uh, not only with the Buddhists in Tibet, but with the uh, Hong Kong students and the pro-democracy advocates, but with the Uyghurs, which uh, the State Department has declared uh, as a genocide. 1.5 million people in forced labor camps. Muslims being uh, forced to eat uh, pork during Ramadan, uh, forced sterilizations, uh, forced labor. We passed the uh, forced, uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Protection Act, Prevention Act, uh, out of the Congress uh, last term. I'm sure we'll do it again, uh, but it went nowhere in the Senate. Uh, I would just ask, you know, we've, we've benefited from China's low-cost products for many, many years and increasing our competition with them. Uh, through the many different ways that we've talked about. And certainly if we were uh, successful in passing the uh, Uyghur Forced Labor Prevention Act, it uh, would cost product prices to go up. Um, can you just discuss generally the balancing of this economic issues, the price issues, the trade issues, and the in the context of human rights violations against the Uyghurs? Congressman Swazi, I know the leadership that um, uh, you have exercised on um, uh, this particular issue and um, the bill um, that came up last uh, last year and that uh, may come up again this year. Um, <clears throat> let me say this. I think we have come a very, very long way in um, the development and formulation of American trade policies uh, where um, uh, labor rights, uh, environmental protection, um, human rights uh, were not a part of the conversation, were not allowed to be part of the conversation um, uh, just a couple decades ago. Um, now uh, we have, um, on a bipartisan basis here in the United States, um, uh, labor, uh, environment, uh, human rights, um, uh, rule of law, good governance, anti-corruption um, uh, components in um, our core uh, trade policy programs, and I think it's something we should be very uh, proud of, because at the end of the day, um, these are economic issues. They are issues that impact the terms of economic competition. Forced labor is um, at root uh, not just um, a, a, an abominable exploitation, um, but also uh, functions as a very crude subsidy. Um, that drives the low costs. That is the, the, the race to the bottom that we talk about uh, when we talk about trade policies and, and fair trade policies, good trade policies. 
Um, so um, this is absolutely something um, that uh, uh, that we need to focus on. Uh, we cannot silo these issues um, outside of economic policy, um, international trade policy, and uh, they deserve um, uh, they deserve a focus and priority uh, from the United States and the administration, and also from Congress. You know, you know already, I'm sure, Ambassador, but for my colleagues to know also is that, you know, one of the largest providers of cotton to the United States of America and to the world is through China. And 80% of the cotton from China comes from the Xinjiang region. This will cause an increase in our prices, I'm sure, but, and there'll be a lot of pushback, but we really need to hold them accountable uh, for their forced labor. And we need to put the burden on them as opposed to putting the burden on us to figure out when it's forced labor and when it's not. Uh, thank you so much for your help and support on this very important issue. Thank the gentleman. We will now recognize the gentlelady from Washington State, Ms. Del Benny, to inquire. Then we will take a quick break. Ms. Uh, Tai has uh, been with us for almost three hours of two and a half hours of testimony. So we will just take a five minute break and then we will go back to Mr. Rice. The gentlelady from Washington, Ms. Del Benny, is recognized to inquire. Thank you, Mr. Chairman, and thank you so much, Ambassador, for being with us today. It's great to see you. Um, I, like many of my colleagues, am concerned about our traditional allies and trading partners in Europe and Asia advancing restrictive digital trade policies. Um, these actions include a growing number of digital services taxes, which U.S. companies are now paying, as well as the recent invalidation of the U.S. EU Privacy Shield, uh, which helped thousands of businesses of all sizes to transfer data between the U.S. and Europe. Um, in March, Congressman LaHood and I, as co-chairs of the Digital Trade Caucus, sent you a letter urging USTR to prioritize addressing these issues and engage with our allies and our trading partners to update trade agreements with new digital trade rules. Um, we also asked you to designate senior level personnel and other resources so that we can execute a strong digital strategy and voiced our support for a new trade and technology dialogue with the EU. Um, I believe that members of Congress and Parliament should have the opportunity to engage in such a dialogue. Um, so this is a top priority. I wondered what your current plan was with respect to digital trade, um, addressing issues like digital services taxes um, and the privacy shield and um, what your goals are moving forward. Thank you, Congressman. I'm not surprised at all that um, uh, your questions um, are, are uh, themed around uh, digital and digital trade. Um, and it's a real uh, pleasure to see you and to um, uh, engage with you on your questions. Um, let me take them in uh, roughly reverse order. I think when you mentioned the privacy shield, uh, that one is the easiest one for me to respond to because uh, it's really in the purview of the Commerce Department. So um, I'll just say um, Secretary Raimondo and I uh, talk to each other quite a bit on a number of issues. Um, and um, I just want to acknowledge that she is a more expert um, uh, person and uh, member of the cabinet on this particular issue than I am. So uh, I don't want to commit uh, whatever malpractice might be involved by um, uh, saying too much on that, except that uh, I know that uh, there are important equities at stake um, in that issue and that they are important to you. On digital services taxes, um, uh, we do have a number of Section 301 investigations that were opened last year that um, we continue to work through in terms of um, uh, the 301 procedure. And um, uh, this is an area where USDR is partnered um, uh, hand in glove with uh, the US Treasury Department to address um, the digital services taxes that have been proposed um, <clears throat> through the OECD seeking um, a multilateral solution. Uh, and we are here to support the Treasury Department's uh, efforts and we coordinate very closely with them. Um, on digital trade, um, uh, yes, I mean, you know, um, this, is, this is about the economy that we have right now, uh, and it is going to be critical to shaping the economy that we are going to have uh, into the future. Uh, this is a very high priority. Um, I do want to invite uh, you and Congressman LaHood and others who are interested in the Congress uh, in terms of um, uh, digital trade rules. Um, that at USTR, the question we are asking ourselves is um, consistent with the worker-centered trade policy. Uh, to start with the fundamental question, um, how are the trade policies we are formulating right now going to impact 
um, workers and regular people. Um, I think in trade, we often uh, very easily fall into um, uh, our muscle memory of thinking about trade and the U.S. economy along very macro lines. Uh, we deal with um, states, um, countries, sorry. Um, uh, you know, we do international trade. We are thinking about entire sectors and segments of our economy. Um, but we really do want to break things down to the individual level, to the community level. And on digital trade, the challenge that I think is very interesting for us that we would like to um, innovate uh, with um, you and others here is um, as we are formulating digital trade rules and policies, how can we also account for how these policies are going to impact uh, regular people? Um, I think privacy is, is one example, perhaps, but I think that there are a lot of other ways in which we can think about formulating these rules, and I'd be very excited uh, to work with you because I know um, how much you have thought about these issues and how much you are a leader um, in this area. Thank you. Also, just quickly, um, do you have an opinion on the EU's proposal to establish a transatlantic trade and technology council? So we have been talking to um, uh, the European Union, our uh, counterparts in the Commission, um, and um, uh, we're very interested in what they've proposed uh, and are working on a formal response. Thank you. Thank you so much. I yield back, Mr. Chairman. Thank the gentlelady. Uh, we will take a five-minute break, and we will come back, and the chair will recognize the gentleman from South Carolina, Mr. Rice, to inquire. <laughs> 